basically, I'm not going to give a course in complexity theory. That's how I'm going to get away with being a physicist. Um, rather than talking about just pure complexity theory for all three lectures, I'm going to talk about complexity theory today. But then I'm going to see talk about some results that are some of the key, some of the key results or one of the key results in in quantum complexity theory. Um, but that connects somehow with physics, with many body quantum physics, since this is in principle a condensed matter summer school. And then the same for the last, last lecture about computability. And I mean, hopefully I'll have some time here to tell you about some fairly recent, uh, you know, more closer to research work results. Okay, so uh, I should say, so the, um, I'm going to put course notes up after the lecture, uh, lecture notes that will have a bit more content in than I'm actually going to tell you about during the lectures because I don't have so much time. They'll be up on the Boulder Summer School website at some point, but it's quicker. I can upload them to my own website quicker. So they'll be, I'll upload these immediately after the lecture to that page. OK, so let's start with talking about computation. So what does it mean? First thing we need in order to understand anything about complexity theory, computability, is what it means to compute. And in fact, this is not so obvious. It took until, you know, in some sense, Euclid. The ancient Greeks already had some notion of what it meant to compute, but it took until the 19, it took until 1936 and Alan Turing to pin down finally what, precisely what it means to compute, or at least the definition that's now the one that everyone accepts. So let me, uh, let's start by actually discussing what, what Turing's model of computation was. So Turing had this picture of, imagined a device that you have a, an infinite tape and you have some head. Right, this is old technology. This is technology that was going out when I was growing up. And for you guys, you've never seen a tape deck. But this is, you have a, a tape, which is just a, a line of cells where, you can, where I can write some symbols. Let's write sigma. And then you have uh, something that can read the symbol off that tape. And then it's got some internal state Q. Let's call that Q. And then based on what its internal state is and what, it's, what symbol it reads, it then either moves left or right. And it might write a new symbol, overwrite the symbol here, and then moves left or right. So this was Turing's model of computation from his 1936 paper. So this is an infinite tape. And so there's some, um, so this, to define this machine, we have some, um, some finite set of states, Q0, Q1, Qf, which plays a special role. And then we have some finite set of symbols on the tape. So call those sigma 0, sigma 1, etc. And then some special symbol that we call the, that's the blank symbol. And then, it's supposed to be a capital sigma. And then we have some rules that tell us how, given a internal state and a symbol that we're currently, so the current internal state and the symbol, we have some transition rules that tell us, okay, what new symbol do we write? What new state do we transition to internally? And then do we move left or right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> increase the font. Do you want me to? Um, would you like the margins justified or? <laughs> okay. So I'll try and do that. Um, okay. So. Okay. So and then and so then we have to have some convention about how. So what? How do we start this computation? Well. The convention is we start, the tape is entirely blank, filled with the blank symbol, except that the input to this computation is just some finite string of symbols starting at cell 0. And then what's the output of this computation in this model? Well, the Turing machine runs until it enters some internal state, special state QF for final. And then it stops, right, or a halting state. And then the output of the computation is whatever is left written on the tape. 
So that was a. So you could, we can make this. We could make this more mathematically precise and rigorous, but I'm not going. I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, I wanted to have a concrete model of computation in in mind, um, and now that now I can define what it means to be able to compute something, and this is half of the content of Turing's amazing 1936 paper. So we can now say that a function from some domain, so some subset of the natural numbers, where I don't have natural numbers here, what do I mean? Well, nowadays a lot of describing a Turing machine is rather easy because we have real computers and we're very used to the fact that a number and the binary representation of that number are the same thing. So think of a num natural number as being written on this tape as input in binary, say. OK, and then, so we say that a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers is computable. If there's some Turing machine, which given input n, in our domain, halts in a finite time. <coughs> with output, and we now know what output means, it leaves this natural number, f of n, written on the tape in, let's say, binary. And OK, so that's what it means to be computable if it was a function from all of the natural numbers to some of the, nat to, to the natural numbers. I want to introduce this to partial computable. Maybe this function isn't defined over all, na all natural numbers. If it's not defined on all na natural numbers, we want it to do something on the, if we give it an invalid input, so we give it a bogus number that's not in our, not in our domain, then we want, we'll say, by convention, we'll require our Turing machine to run forever, never enter the halt state. So it never actually outputs anything. Right, it should never see these inputs. If we're trying to compute f of n and f is only defined on even numbers, then we ought to put an even give it an even number. But this tells, gives some convention of what the machine does if we input some bogus input, like an odd number in that case. OK. Why? So if, just some terminology, if it's a function on all of the natural numbers, then we say that f is total computable. OK, this is a definition of computation. Right? It's, you play with it a bit, it seems kind of reasonable. Why is this the right definition of computation? Um, why, for example, why not have a, you know, what if I have a semi-infinite tape? Right? I don't have this half of the tape. Does that make any difference? Or what if I allow my head to stay still as well as move left and right? Or what if I don't have a Turing machine at all? What if I have something completely different like the circuit model? Or maybe something more exotic, like lambda calculus, or mu recursive functions that Gödel introduced a few years earlier than Turing, or cellular automata, Conway's game of life, or just billiard balls. There are all kinds of ways we could define model computation. Um, and so why is this the right one, and why is this the accepted one? Well, the reason is that it turns out it just doesn't actually matter how we model computation. And this is the content of something that you'll have certainly heard about. And that's the content of the Church Turing thesis. And this gives us some confidence that this strange, or maybe not so strange, model of Turing mo model that Turing came up with for computation turns out to be very convenient and very nice model of computation to work with theoretically. It's a horrendous pain to actually program a Turing machine, but as long as we just have to prove theorems about what a Turing machine does, it's a very very elegant model of computation. And then we can appeal to this thesis that the class of computational problems, sorry, com of computable functions, so which I've just defined over there, so that what functions you compute is independent of the model of computation we choose.
for all reasonable models of computation at least. Okay, I'm sure you've all heard the Church Turing thesis um, before. So, let's see if you're awake. Who can tell? So, can anyone, does anyone know of something that threatens the Church Turing thesis? <laughs> I'll come to that. Okay, good. This is what the answer I wanted. No. Okay, quantum computing has says nothing about the Church Turing thesis, of, that, of what others I've written here, the original Church Turing thesis. But thanks for, like, you probably knew that this was, I was going to, then that was what I was looking for, the wrong answer. But, um, so, quantum computers. Is there a way to general, like, model of computation? Is there a way to general, like, model of computation, what does that mean? Let me, let me come to that. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that, so the Church Turing thesis is perfectly valid for quantum computation, too. Everything that you can compute on a Turing machine, classical Turing machine, you can also, sorry, anything you can compute with a quantum computer, you can also compute on a classical Turing machine. Probably much slower, but the Church Turing thesis says nothing about how fast you can compute. Can I use this as a definition of Good, okay. So this, there's been like uh, about a, I mean, Church and Tur neither Church, so neither Alonzo Church nor Turing ever wrote down this. Okay, this has kind of somehow got called this later and sort of came out of a synthesis of experience with trying to study models of computation. And it's been viewed by very different ways in, by different people. So even if you look at the sort of the grandfathers of theoretical computer science, so Gödel viewed this just as an axiom. You just take it as something to start from, and then you can derive stuff from it and build a theory on top of it. Klein um, considered this a definition, a definition of reasonable, and this answers your problem. So a reasonable model of computation would be one that satisfies this. Okay, so now it's not even, it's circular, right? Well, it, it becomes, a, it's a definition rather than telling us anything new. Um, Post, and I think Scott Aronson would consider this a natural law. So something that is true in our universe. Or perhaps Scott's position is more closer to that of Copeland, who thought that, who viewed this as a, an empirical fact that we've gathered a lot of evidence for this from the real world in building computers and studying different models of computation, and this always seems to hold up. And there's still, philosophers are still arguing about what this means today. So this is why it's called a thesis, right? No one really knows what a thesis is. Right? You know what a definition is, a lemma is, a theorem, a proposition, <laughs> thesis? I mean, who's ever heard of thesis? It's not one of the standard latex theorem-like environments. So, you know, that's a nice way of... Okay, but however, the church Turing thesis has been proven for every model of comp computation that people have come up with and tried, and even some very non-ones that look nothing like the, um, the Turing machines. So, for example, um, Turing quickly proved that lambda calculus, another model of computation due to church, um, I mean, an alternative model of computation around from pretty much the same time, that lambda calculus and and uh, Turing machines were equivalent. Um, for the recur mu recursive functions that Gödel's uh, in some sense model of computation or computable then that, that was proven, proven equivalent by Turing, Church and Kleene. Von Neumann proved that cellular automata are equivalent to Turing machines. Conway proved that the game of life, or I think, I don't know whether Conway proved the uh, Turing equivalence of game of life, but okay, someone proved that for Conway's game of life. Friedkin and Toffoli for billiard balls and etc. etc. Every reasonable model of computation that people have come up with. When, when something doesn't fit the church Turing thesis, it's because there's something obviously unreasonable. So, for example, you allow your computer to run for a uh, countably infinite number of steps before halting and allow that to be something. That, okay, it's clear what the unreasonableness is there. You want your answer in a finite amount of time before the universe ends, right? So, so, so far this has held up so, so well that people now just take it as a definition, axiom, uh, natural law, empirical fact, whatever, and rely on it. Okay, but this, this, at least for all of them, any model of computation you will ever come up with, it'll be equivalent to this, or I'll be able to tell you it's unreasonable. Good. So, like that we can, so, theoretical computer science really, essentially all of theoretical computer science typically builds on the foundation of, the, it takes Turing machines fun fundamentally as the, as the basic model of computation. Okay. The other part, so one part of what Turing's remarkable 1936 paper was to pin down a very clean, elegant notion of what compute to compute meant. And in Gödel, immediately when he saw this, said that, okay, this is the right model of computation. Um, uh, and and uh, the reason Gödel viewed it as the right model, in some sense, is because this is something that is very, 
it's an idealized model, but it's something you could imagine actually building. Right? Unlike mu recursive functions or lambda calculus, which is much, much more abstract, this is something that like, really seems to be close to something you could actually have in the physical world. And indeed, people these days have built Turing machines out of Lego. OK, the other half of Turing's seminal paper was that there exist uncomputable functions. So what, and the one that, the problem that Turing proved is uncomputable is the halting problem, as I'm sure you've all heard. So this is Turing 1936. So what does this say? It says that if I have, I'm going to now take a function of two inputs, two natural numbers. It's a Boolean function, so it's a function from two natural numbers to 0 or 1. And this is what the function does. It's 1 if the nth Turing machine halts on input i, and it's 0 otherwise. So this is one way of phrasing the undecidability of halting. So this is a definition of a function on natural numbers, and what Turing proved is that this is not computable. It's not in the set of functions that I defined over on that board. This is kind of one of the most, uh, I mean, this is certainly one of the big results of the 20th century. And it's really very easy to prove. So let's actually prove this un uh, undecidability of the halting. How many, have, how many people could come up here and prove undecidability of halting for me? Or have seen it before? Let's say seen it before. OK, half. Okay, I think I'm going to, I think it's worth going through. You ought to see this once in your lives. OK, I'm going to, this is. So slightly informal. I'm going to gloss over some details, but I'm going to tell you what I'm glossing over, and you can fill in the details if you want to. Um, here's one. There's lots of ways of proving this. So let's take f to be any, any total computable function. And now we're going to construct. So remember, thanks to Turing, we can think of functions and Turing machines as essentially the same thing. Right? A function is equivalent to a Turing machine that computes that function. So we can c c construct a new function, or if you like, a Turing machine. You can think about it either way, whichever you prefer. So it's 0 if f of i, i is 0, and 1 if f of i, i is 1. Okay. So if you've ever programmed, so here's a detail I'm glossing over. I have to actually construct a Turing machine that does this. Okay, So I need, a, I need to call this as a subroutine. I'm told that there is a way of doing, uh, there is a subroutine for that by assumption. It's as a computable function. I call this as a subroutine. I check its output. I have, a, have to construct an if statement. And then based on the con that looking at that condition of the if statement, I've, OK, building if statements and subroutines on Turing machines is a pain. Turing did it. I'm going to gloss over that. If you want to go away and fill in the details, go and take this model of computation and figure out how to build if statements and subroutine calls in that. OK. Now let's, think, now let's look at the two possibilities. So let's imagine that f of gg is equal to 0. Uh, what am I doing here? I'm feeding a function into a function here. OK, but this is a, remember, we can think of this as function equivalently as a Turing machine. A Turing machine is just some, bu some bunch of finite amount of, inf of data. Right, I need to list this. I need to ha tell, say how many symbols there are, how many internal states, what the transition rules are. This is just some finite amount of data. I could express this in binary and then think of that as a number. OK, so I can feed Turing machines and natural numbers um, and functions, I can, sw I can uh, move between those two freely, those three freely. 
So let's imagine what happens if I feed g and g to, as input to this function here. Well, in this case, g of g halts, right? Because f of g, g is 0. So f of g, g is 0. So in this case, this halts. That implies the halting function on g, on, on, sorry, on, yeah, the halting function on g, g. So does the Turing machine g halt on input g? Well, uh, yes. Here we go. Uh, the Turing machine g running on input g halts. So the halting function on that is on g, g is 1, which is not equal to f. And now let's look at the other case. f of g, g is equal to 1. Well, that implies that we're in this case. I'm sorry, this shouldn't help. But this is not so out of one bug in my program. So to, if once I've debugged this, g should output 0 if fi equals 0. And if f of i equals 1, it should be undefined. Or in equivalently on Turing machines, it should loop forever. So you have to construct an infinite loop on a Turing machine. Again, Turing did that. We don't have to. Or either you trust Turing, or you can go away and do it for yourself. OK, so now g, g, in this case, now I fix this. f of, I, f of g, g is 1. g of g loops forever. But that means that h of g, g, that does g halt on input g? Well, the answer in this case is no. So that should be 0. But that's also not equal to f of g, g. OK, so we've got some function f that we've just shown cannot be equal to the halting function. But we made no assumptions about f except that other than it was computable. So we now have a contract. So now that we've just shown that no computable function can be equal to this function h, the halting function. So the halting function is the halting problem is undecidable. And the only details I've glossed over in this half a board proof are doing actually going away and doing the constructions of the Turing machines involved. OK, if you see this, this is actually another way of proving this. Is this is actually a variant of a Cantor diagonal argument, which the, the argument used to prove that the real numbers are uncountable. You can see this is proof that way. I encourage you to go away and think about how you can see the kind of diagonal structure in this proof. OK, the halting function is halting, undecidability of halting is extremely uh, simple result, but it's also incredibly powerful. So if you've ever been intrigued by Gödel's theorems, well, an almost immediate corollary of the undecidability of halting is Gödel's first in incompleteness theorem. I'm not going to this is a trivial corollary of undecidability of halting. So Gödel's first incompleteness theorem says if you take any consistent, complete, I'm not going to define any of these terms, uh, recursive, axiomatizer, any reasonable, only Gödel actually pins down what reasonable means, axiomatization of mathematics. In British, there's an S on the end of maths, but you can delete it if you want. Um, then there exist, there exist, uh, why am I writing that out? There exist mathematical statements, uh, statements in not just any old mathematics, statements in arithmetic. So just uh, multiplication, addition, subtraction, etc., of, of uh, natural numbers or of integers that can be neither proven or disproven. There are statements in mathematics that are neither true nor false, or I shouldn't even talk about true and false, but there are statements that you can show, prove, can't be proven to be true or false. OK, and the proof idea, I, I'm not going to go through it in any detail, but informally, the kind of sketch of the idea is, well, this axiomatization of mathematics, this, what does this give us? It gives us some set of starting axioms and then some rules for deriving theorems from them. Those rules for deriving theorems are something you can implement on a Turing machine. At the end of the day, it's just shuffling symbols around, and Turing machines are very good at shuffling symbols around. So you just construct a Turing machine that 
enumerates over all of the proofs you can derive from this set of axioms. In, as, and, and it does them in order of length, so it, derive, it, uh, enum it generates the longer and longer things you can derive from the axioms, and it stops if it ever hits a statement that proves the thing true or proves the thing false. But now the halting problem is a statement in arithmetic. It's just a statement about numbers. You can express it as a, state, uh, in, uh, as a statement about whether you apply some procedures involving just basic arithmetic to numbers, does it halt or not? So this would give us a way of deciding the halting problem um, if we could decide this. So we can't. Another thing you can get from... So maybe you're thinking that this halting problem is a bit esoteric. I don't actually care about Turing machines. You know, this is undecidability of something that maybe is not that important. So let me answer that criticism. Another ra fairly easy corollary of undecidability of halting is that any non-trivial property, this is called Rice's theorem, any non-trivial property of partial functions is undecidable. And what do I, what's the definition of non-trivial here? Definition of non-trivial anything that isn't either true for all functions or false for all functions. So Rice's theorem tells us that essentially almost any property of functions that we ask about is undecidable in the same way as the halting problem. I'm going to leave the proof of Rice's theorem as an exercise. You should go away and actually do it. So, proof exercise. So this is not, there's an not, it's not very difficult, given undecidability of halting, to give a proof of Rice's theorem on this kind of level, where you gloss over details that are obviously, one could fill in with some effort. Yeah. So it has some domain that's not the all of the natural numbers. We don't, I mean, so ha if, if, if a function is total computable, it halts on all inputs. Right? If it's, if, but it, what if its domain of the function is only the even numbers? But the Turing machine has to do something on the odd numbers, right? Because we could feed that in and run it. So this is just a convention of, okay, what does, how do we model some function not being defined on, a, on, its on some on outside of its domain in, on a Turing machine? So the right convention is to say, okay, on those, it doesn't produce any output. How does the Turing machine not produce any output? The only way it cannot produce any output is to never actually stop. Because once it stops, the output is whatever's left. So you can't just say it produces the wrong output? Uh, this, th then how do you distinguish between, um, w what's the wrong output? I mean, this might be a partial function that might map to all of the... Um, Okay, but that's very easily equivalent, right? Because then I can detect if it's a bad out, uh, uh, output, and then I can just run forever then. I could always turn it into one of these. So without, I mean, this is a, you know, with a, this works for all cases, unlike what you're suggesting, and I can turn what you're suggesting into this on the cases where it works. So this is a nice, reasonable definition. Or it it's a definition that works very well. So there has been I mean, throwing an error is running forever here. But if you actually, if you set, put in throwing an error, that's just some at, some specific output, right? I can model that as a, that's some, I could just map that to some natural number. And then the problem is that I can't do that, right? Because there are things, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't solve anything, right? I'm, it's Turing machines all the way down. 
that's just like turning a partial function into a total function, and that's fine. That's covered by this definition. Okay, that was a very, very brief uh, one. So the last thing, the other thing, Turing did a lot of things in this paper, and it's not a long paper. Um, so, you know, these days, papers simply tend to contain less useful content in one paper. We spread it over as many as possible to boost our bibliometrics. But in Turing's, Turing's day, he wasn't worried about that. So not only did he come up with the model of computation that stood the test of time, proved undecidability of the halting problem, thereby solving one of Hilbert's problems, that's the list of problems that the mathematician David Hilbert came up with as the most important for 20th century mathematics. And he also construct showed that there exists a universal Turing machine. Turing showed that there exist, um, or you, even it can ex you can explicitly construct one Turing machine. Which, on input, on input uh, m i, outputs the result of running Turing machine M on input I. So it simulates the Turing machine M on input I. So this is a programmable Turing machine where I can tell it what Turing machine I want to actually I want to simulate with some set of rule transitional states, symbols, etc. And give it and some input, and then what it does is it goes and simulates that Turing machine and outputs the, right, the the appropriate result. And the proof of this again, it's not difficult to see that this is possible. It's kind of easy to see the kind of high level argument, and then going away and filling in all the details is a bit tedious. But um, you construct well, so you have we have to pin down what do we mean by inputting m. So we have to pick some convention for how we write out our Turing machine, encode that into a binary num uh, string and binary number. And then what does the Turing, this universal Turing machine do? Well, it goes and it looks up the transition rules and then um, takes the input and then it looks up what transition rule it should apply, goes and applies it, goes back, looks at the transition rules, sees what it should do next, etc. So the details of constructing that are kind of tedious, but for anyone who's, I mean, nowadays from a modern perspective where we're used to having actual computers, it's not so surprising. Okay, that was a whistle-stop introduction to computability, the basics of computability theory. So computability theory asks, what is it possible to compute, even in principle? And the surprising outcome is that there are some things, one surprising outcome is that there are some things that can't be computed, even in principle. But this is asking about what could we compute in principle with, on an idealized computer with infinite resources. We don't care how long it takes. We don't care how much memory it uses. Just can this something be computed at all? Those are the kind of questions that computability theory addresses. Right? So, where we, where's the infinite memory here? Well, we have an infinitely long tape at our disposal. And, we are, we don't, we, and when we defined computability, we said it should halt, uh, it should halt in finite time. But we didn't, that could be a very, very big finite time, arbitrarily large, but finite. So to study what can be computed on real computers, with, uh, on realistic, more realistic resource-limited computers, where we want an answer within the lifetime of the universe, and our computers don't have infinite memory, um, then we need a, a finitary version of computability theory. Um, to borrow, um, if you like to borrow some math, math uh, or so you can, s and that, that's what we call complexity theory. So complexity theory studies, what can you compute when your resources, your computational resources, time, space, for example, are limited? So let's give you, so let's have a brief, brief introduction to um, complexity theory. Are there any questions about this so far? Sure. About the problem, yeah. Uh, let's say, here's both the list of Turing machines and the list of inputs is kind of infinite. What if I make one of those finite? Then is the whole thing problem cyclical? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes. Is, I mean, the short answer is yes. 
So if the input is finite, then um, then so uh, any function on a finite domain, so finite possible number of inputs, is computable. The argument is a bit unsatisfying, but it's it's a sort of cheat. But I could figure out what the answer is on all of those finite number of cases, and then my my the machine I construct is just a lookup table, essentially that. I program in a lookup table that it just goes and looks up the answer in the table. Could be that actually figuring out what that lookup table is, is is uncomputable or we haven't, but it doesn't matter. But the definition of computability allows that kind of cheat if you've got a finite number of inputs. And then you can ask, okay, is that machine actually constructible itself, which is then a meta question and that you can make precise and then you can study the computability of that. Um, but so yes, on a finite, and that's a very good point. Well, I'm actually, yeah. I meant like a finite number of machines, let's say, but ah. all inputs. Okay, that's, a, that's a another good question, but the answer is here. This is, I just have one Turing machine that can simulate all others. And this has two inputs, but I could mash them together into one, right? By just some convention of how I encode things in, into some binary string. So that's an important, another important point. So it, there is the halting problem. Many variants of the halting problem are undecidable. In particular, the halting problem is undecidable if I say I fix the Turing machine, but I allow the inputs to vary. It's also undecidable if I say the input has to be, for example, the all blank input, but I allow the Turing machine to. I ask the question about different Turing machines. Both of those cases, it's undecidable, still. This is asking about computability of a single function that's on a finite domain. Let's make it only, it's a function on the numbers 1 through 10. That's what I meant by that. Anything else on, before I move on to complexity? Good, okay. Okay, so I'll give you a similarly brief introduction to complexity theory for the remainder of this lecture. So, so complexity theory is the rigorous analysis of the computational resources required to solve problems. So resources typically things like space, time, you could think about energy or other things, but um, I mean for the purposes of this course and most of complexity theory, the, the key resources people are interested in are space and time. I mean space, I mean mem by space I mean memory. So in a Turing machine model memory means how much of the tape we use and time how many steps we take before we halt. Um, more precisely complexity theory is about the scaling of resources with the problem size. Scaling of com computational resources, so space, time, etc., with with problem size. So, what do I mean? The first thing we need to, f to in order to understand complexity theory, is we need to understand what do I mean by problem size, and what in even is a computational problem. So a computational, when we talk about a computational problem, we, ne we don't mean one problem. We mean an entire family of related problems. And then the problem size is the amount of information required to specify an incident, instant, instance, sorry, that problem. So let me talk a bit more about, about that, F uh, flesh that out a bit. So instead of just giving some abstract definitions, let me just instead just give exam some examples. So for example, the f take the factoring problem. What's the factoring problem? It's not factor the number 15. That's an instance of the factoring problem. The factoring problem has as input an integer n. 
and the output should be, say, the factors of m. So there's an entire family of pro the factoring problem in computer science speak is all of the problems that look like that. So factoring 15 is one instance of this problem. Factoring 21 is another instance. The factoring problem itself is that entire family of problems. And to get a sense of what problem size might mean, well, here, what looks like a good measure of the problem size? So maybe something like the number of digits uh, in n. In other words, which goes as something like, which is, goes as log n. Seems like a good measure of the problem size here. So get another example. You've probably also hold of, heard of the SAT problem, satisfiability problem. Here, the input is a Boolean expression over some variables, over variables, let's, some Boolean variables, so uh, variables that can take the value 0 and 1, and then some, uh, some expression built out of combining these with Boolean operations and or not, etc. What are we supposed to output if we're solving the SAT problem? Yes, if there exists values, there's some way of assigning values to these Boolean variables such that the whole expression evaluates the true. Or to 1. And otherwise we should output no. So this is an example of a function from, we could represent, encode that in some canonical way in a, in a natural number. And then so this is a function to binary values. So what should we take as the problem size here? Well, what's like, what, maybe the number of Boolean variables seems like a good bet. <coughs> but what about how complicated this expression is over those Boolean variables? Um, maybe number of Boolean variables seems like a reasonable choice, but there are other choices. Maybe we're missing something because we're neglecting to account for how complicated it is to write down an ex the, the expression. Maybe there are, the problem is easier or harder depending on how complicated this expression is. So fundament typically in complexity theory, the, what the problem size, and even in textbooks and certainly in papers, Something like this is always taken, is typically taken as the stand-in for problem size. So the number of digits in the fact for the number we're trying to factor, or the number of Boolean variables in the SAT um, expression. But fundamentally, there is a precise definition of what problem size means. Can anyone take a guess at what, how we can define that precisely? Good. I mean, at the moment, for the purposes of this lecture course so far, you only know one model of computation, so it best to be something to do with Turing machines. And indeed, the problem size is the number of non-blank symbols we have to write down to feed that problem, to, to write down that problem instance as input to a Turing machine. So fundamentally, in complexity theory, that is always what problem size means fundamentally, and that's precise, well-defined, unambiguous, once we specify what Turing machine. So pick some universal Turing machine. There isn't, this isn't unique. You can construct lots of different, pick one of them, Problem size then precisely means number of non-blank symbols on the input to that Turing machine. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. So in the church Turing cases, we didn't say anything about how much nope. there is. No. Anything? I'll talk about that later in a moment, but yeah. Uh, the, I just stated the computer, co the original church Turing thesis, which is about computability, not about complexity theory. And there's a strong, the strong church Turing thesis, which then introduces, is relevant for complexity theory. Okay, so when you're doing any working in complexity theory or, in, or looking at analysis of algorithms, typically you never need to go down to that level and think about, okay, how would I represent this input on a Turing machine? Occasionally that does, there are some subtleties there and you have to take it into account. Usually it's pretty obvious that if I, the number of digits here is the right, something that is going to go, the number, of, um, the number of symbols I need on a Turing machine, well, it's going to depend a little bit. For example, it will depend on what base I write my numbers in. Do I write it in base 2, base 10 on my Turing machine? But however I choose to write it, the number of 
symbols I'm going to need on an input is going to go as some polynomial in n. Right? This already tells us that uh, n is the right measure here. So the number of sorry, the number of digits in that number is the right measure, not the size of the number itself, right? Because the number of digits is going to be related at least by at worst a polynomial to the how many symbols I need to write uh, down on my Turing machine. And that only goes as log of the size of the number, not the size of the number itself. Here, if you think a little bit, about, uh, a little bit, you'll see that this is not. A, this is a pref up to polynomials. This is a, a polynomial difference. Um, this is a, a reasonable measure of problem size here. So most complexity theory, you don't actually have to go down to the level of Turing machines and think about how to actually represent the input. But occasionally, it's important to have that in the back of your mind, as that's the fundamental definition, and you can usually get away without actually working on that level. Okay. Very often we're interested in decision problems in complexity theory. Um, so these are problems that are like the SAT problem, as an example of a decision problem. The output is binary, so the output is either 0 or 1, or yes or no. So um, decision problems. So formally, if I, I don't know whether this is even worth doing, but what's it since we're going to all of complexity, well, not all of complexity theory, but a lot of complexity theory is only concerned with decision problems. Let's have a definition. Decision problem is a function from, here's one way of doing it, of defining it with as little chalk as possible. Some input, so any natural number. Here I've written rat as any, uh, partly just to introduce this notation any finite string of zeros and ones, which is, of course, could also think of that as a natural number. But in any case, the function takes a natural number or a finite string of zeros and ones to a uh, Boolean output, so to just zero or one. So that's a d any, any function like that is a decision problem. Um, in the complexity theory and computer science uh, world, you often see decision problems talked about in terms of languages. I'm not going to use that terminology at all, but just to flag to you, that the, what's the, uh, a language, when computer scientists talk about language in the context of a decision problem, the language is the set of all strings that, that are on which the function takes the value 1. That's the definition of a language, in case you see that terminology. OK, why decision problems? Well, one reason is that complexity theory is hard enough. And it turns out that complexity theory becomes a bit more tractable and a Bit, the whole mathematical theory is a bit more elegant and one could say more if one restricts one's attention to decision problems. But you know, why, maybe you're interested in uh, doing more than yet answering yes-no questions. Maybe you want to actually compute some value. And typically, not always, but in practice, computational problems typically have a... There's typically a... This is not such a restriction. So most computational problems that you see in the real world typically have a decision variant that's a pretty natural, that's sort of an, a decision version that's uh, equivalent to the original problem in some obvious way. So one example is, a good example is the factoring problem that I already put up over there. That's not a decision problem, right? The output was supposed to be the factors of the number I fed in. But I can define a decision version of the factoring problem, which is easily quite e fairly easy to see is equivalent to the actual factoring the problem of finding the um, finding the factors so I know you probably can't see some of you can't see this at the back but I'm going to shift this board up in a moment so now we have input two inputs the number we're interested in factoring and k some some constant some number and the output some other integer and the output is then yes if n has a factor below k, and otherwise no. So now that defines a decision problem. And why do I say this is equivalent to the original, the factoring problem I defined over there? Well. If I can solve this problem, then I can figure out what the factors are, not just whether the factors are smaller than some constant, but I just 
past the say it's like playing 20 questions, right? I can just ask, does it have a factor less than 10? Yes. OK. Does it have a factor less than 5? No. Does it have a factor less than 7, etc.? And I can just, in logarithmically many calls to this problem, I can solve that problem. Okay, so if I've got a magic box that solves this problem, I'm pretty happy because that lets me actually find the factors as well. And so this is not always possible. It's not that every fa uh, function problem has a decision variant. But in, in practice, anything you encounter in the real world, outside of artificial complexity theory constructs, um, typically does. So limiting the decision complexity theory to decision problems, um, or the, the fact that complexity theory, most of complexity theory deals with decision problems, is not such a limitation, in fact. Okay. There are, I mean, complexity theory is formulated not just for decision problems, but the bulk of complexity theory um, what's not, and, and the results concern decision problems. So this is just to justify the fact that we're not losing that much by restricting our attention here. Okay. So far, everything I've talked about is just classical computation. And this is supposed to be a lecture course on quantum computation, quantum complexity theory. So we would like to, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually go through and introduce a model of computation because I think you all know a model of computation. It's the circuit model. I guess everyone's f familiar with the circuit model of computation. If you're not, I, you almost certainly couldn't follow Scott's course last week. So, okay, lots of nods. Good. So, so for the, for this, at the moment we have now, we have two com uh, models of computation in mind. We have Classically, I have, at the moment, I have Turing machines in mind. The computational model you know um, of a the one we, I, want, I have in mind as well for this, for this course in quantum model of computation is the circuit model. So let's try and, well, let's do go a little bit further with classical complexity theory and then try to connect to quantum. So, yeah. No. But if you go to the uh, textbook on complexity theory, like Aurora Barak, or the, I put some references in there, there's a kind of diagonalization construction that lets you prove the existence of things that, where this can't be done. Okay, but there, I don't have a natural example. This is what I, and this is what I was trying to emphasize, that in practice, there, they tend to be, there tends to be already, always be a natural equivalent decision version. Question at the back? Yeah. Um, I, so you should fix your universal Turing machine once and for all in advance. Pick one and then do everything with respect to that one. That's just a way of defining away your question. Um, ask me at the end of the lecture, otherwise. OK, so what a complexity class is, the so object of study throughout complexity theory. So complexity classes classify, classify computational problems according to, how, mu uh, to, according to how, mu how difficult they are to solve. So typically in ti time or space. And I'm only going to look at time complexity. So we're going to be, we look at class, that we're, our complexity classes are going to be time complexity classes, all the ones I'm going to introduce. And they, um, they, they look at, they classify problems according to how much time it takes to solve them on a, let's, on a Turing machine. So in the Turing machine model, time and space or memory are quite easy to define. So the problem size we already said, problem size, number of non-blank cells in the input. Time. Number of steps until halt, until you halt. And space, we're not going to have to deal with it, but in case you want to go away and define space complexity classes for fun, number of different number of tape cells accessed by head, by the head. So the number of different tape cells that the head um, reads or writes during the computation. 
And that's pretty natural, and indeed that's the definition of problem size, time, and uh, space in the Turing machine model. So our first complexity class that we can define as one I'm sure you will know and is P, stands for poly time, the class of all problems, all decision problems. So it's a decision class. If someone tells you that factoring in that sense is in P, they're not being very, they're being sloppy. Right? P is by definition only contains decision problems. Usually you can get away with being sloppy and it doesn't actually matter. Solvable in, in a time that scales as some polynomial of the input size. So examples of problems in P, well, all of basic arithmetic, multiplying numbers, adding numbers, um, most linear algebra, um, finding eigenvalues, um, testing whether a number is prime or not, that's in P. That's only known since 2000. Before that, that wasn't, it wasn't known to be in P. If, you think, if, you, if you're a physicist and you, like, you're thinking about eigenvalue problems and you're going, worrying about the fact that but those are real numbers and your matrix might have real entries, yes, we ought to pin down precisely what we mean by finding eigenvalues. What's our input? What are the, how we need to decide, okay, we can only specify the uh, elements of our matrix to some precision, okay, and then we only want the output to some precision. And you should put do all put in all the nitty gritty details to make that a sensible definition. Again, when it comes down to it, you have to decide how is the input going to be fed into the Turing machine, and what kind of outputs do you want out. So you know enough now to go away and formalize that if you wanted to. Okay. The next complexity class and the uh, next most famous, perhaps the most famous, is complexity class MP. NP does not stand for <laughs> so MP does not stand for non-polynomial. That's what physicists think, but you know, I can insult physicists because I am one. But you're not physicists, you're quantum information people, so you're better than that. You know that NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, the name is kind of frankly unfortunate in that it relates to a previous and old, I would say old-fashioned way of thinking about this complexity class. Here's the modern way of thinking about the com this complexity class. Class of decision problems which doesn't connect with the terminology non-deterministic polynomial but just class of all problems for which there exists a polytime verifier Turing machine V such that if the answer is uh, the answer on input X is yes, then this has to hold. There exists a poly-sized witness, W. Okay, here's the formal definition, and then I we're going to talk about it, such that the verifier running on XW is 1, and no, for all witnesses, All witnesses W, uh, V X W equals zero. Okay, there's the definition. The best way to think about the complexity class MP is to think about it as a game between two players, Arthur and Merlin. Merlin is a all-powerful wizard. Arthur is a rather limited, his non-historical British monarch who uh, 
has a classical computer. He has a computer, but he is only limited. He can only do polytime computations. And you know, Merlin, he doesn't entirely trust. But Paul, Arthur has a problem he wants to solve. He doesn't know how to solve in polytime. So he goes to Merlin and asks the wizard for what's the answer to this problem. And he want, but he wants more from Merlin than just the answer back, yes or no. He wants Merlin to actually give him some proof that the answer is yes, um, rather than trusting Merlin. So he can go and check that Merlin isn't lying. So for example, he wants to factor some number. He gives Merlin the number to f he wants to factor, because Arthur is pretty stupid and doesn't even know how to factor numbers on his polytime computer. He doesn't realize he can. So he, he asks Merlin, OK, what are the factors of this? Does this number have a, does this have a factor below k? And Merlin has to give back not only just say yes or no, but has to prove to, Mer to Arthur that he's not lying. So in that case, Merlin can easily prove that he's not lying by just giving back the factors. Arthur can check those by multiplying them together and checking they give the number he started with. He was interested in factoring. OK, so in generally, Merlin doesn't just provide a, the answer, but also a proof or a witness that the answer that the if he, if the answer is yes then he can he gives a witness that that answer is really yes that can be checked efficiently and on the other hand so there's an asymmetry between yes and no here merlin has to prove yes results but for no no results he just has to not be able to trick arthur into thinking the answer was yes okay there's an asymmetry between yes and no here they don't play the same role right? there's another class called co-np where these two are switched I mean, how would Merlin prove that a number doesn't have a factor smaller than k? Okay, it turns out that can be done, but uh, it's not quite so obvious, right? So there's the, the, it's not so. And they, by the definition of the complexity classes, there is no there is an asymmetry between these two. So prove yes answers, don't cheat on no answers. Okay, we'd like. I've been talking for one hour about classical computation, so let's now finally talk about quantum computation. We'd like to generalize these complexity classes to quantum uh, to quantum computation. So the problem is I've defined them all in the Turing machine model of computation classically, but we only know the circuit model uh, quantum mechanically. So one thing I could do is to define quantum Turing machines. It was done finally in around 1995 by Bernstein and Vazirani. It's, as I think Scott once quipped, the only important thing about Turing machines is that they exist. The last thing you want to do is ever construct one uh, in a, even theoretically or let alone program one. So it's very important, it's really crucial to the foundations of quantum complexity theory that Bernstein and Vazirani did that, um, but I'd rather not, it's a very long and technical paper and the, it's not so easy to construct like quantum Turing machines. I'd rather stick to the circuit model. So let's go the other route, let's see how P and NP look in the classical circuit model, which you also, uh, you also know, because if you know the quantum circuit model, you know the classical circuit model. It's just the case, special case where all the gates are diagonal in the computational basis. Yeah? I don't think you, you made fun of this is not, thinking of NP being a non-polynomial, so let me ask. So, so, okay, so it doesn't stand for non-polynomial, but is it correct to understand NP problems or problems in which you cannot find a solution to the polynomial? No. So can you that is exact, that's exactly the P equals MP, P versus MP question. So if, if we could prove that P is not equal to MP, what you just said would be correct. Yeah, that would imply that problems in MP cannot be solved in polynomial time. But we don't know if P is equal to MP or not. So could be could go the other way. I thought it was a law of nature. No, no, that's that's the definition of computer, the co of reasonable in computation. Last week oh, Scott. Oh, Scott so thinks it's... Yeah, but this is Scott trying to be a physicist, and he's not. He's a complexity theorist. <laughs> but for what true, that's... Yeah, if it were true, what you said is, is, is correct, but we don't... You know, there's no proof of that. Yeah. So think of MP as the... Another way, I mean, this, this, this way of thinking about it, as this Merlin-Arthur game is, is one way. Another way of thinking about it is these are problems where you can check the answer easily if someone gives it to you, but it doesn't say anything about whether the answer is easy to find or not. It might be really difficult to find the answer. We just, oh, it might be easy, we don't know. I mean, the problem is an MP, as long as its an answers can be checked easily. And then there's all kinds of both good intuition, empirical evidence, and even computer science theoretical evidence that points towards P not being equal to MP. And I mean, Scott has an extremely nice article on kind of giving a good, I mean, that's fairly convincing in sort of persuading me at least that if I had to bet, I'll bet on P not being equal to MP. But there was a survey amongst theoretical computer scientists some years ago, and it was split actually surprisingly evenly. 
OK, how do we define these complexity classes? I'm still talking about classical computation. But I want to get to quantum, but we need to now understand what these complexity classes are, look like in the circuit model, because that's all we know about quantumly. So how do we define P and MP in the classical circuit model? Well, we could take, we could take uh, problem size. Well, we could take number of input bits to the circuit, number of bits we feed into the circuit, time. Well, it seems reasonable to take that as the number of gates, or the gate depth, if you like. They'll differ up to a polynomial, and all of our complexity classes we're dealing with don't care about polynomials. So let's try first attempt at defining P. Problem solvable with a with a poly time, in other words, poly number of gates circuit. i.e. circuit, what a poly time circuit, i.e. circuit poly number of gates. It's a bit confusing. In the circuit model, it's very tempting to say poly size circuit, but when we're talking about time complexity. OK, this is a nice definition of a complexity class. It's the definition of a complexity class called p slash poly. Unfortunately, it's not the one we want. This, for example, here's an example of a problem. Here are some examples of problems in this complexity class. Factoring, uh, multiplying numbers, the halting problem. This complexity class contains undecidable problems, as well as ones that are solvable in poly time in the traditional sense. And it doesn't contain all problems. So it's a very curious complexity class that contains both doesn't contain all problem, computational problems, but it does contain undecidable, some undecidable problems, like the halting problem. Um, OK, I'm going to leave proof that, the, proof that the halting problem is in this class. Prove halting is in p slash poly. Go away and think about it. All of these exercises I'm giving you are things where it's, there's not a lot of math to do to, to solve the problems. They're just that you have, there's a lot of thinking to do. OK, here's the issue. What's going on here? The problem is that I've, um, you want to ask before? That's in the Turing machine model of computation. This I've desi designed in terms of circuits. OK, yeah, let's go here and then here. The definition of P, the complexity class, is only, it by definition, only contains decision problems. OK, you can define function P, which is a complexity class of function problems and that are solvable, that are computable in polynomial time. Not everything in FP can be turned into a uh, uh, decision problem in a natural way, but everything you'll ever manage to think up or ever no meet in reality can. This is what I was talking about earlier. Decision problems? Yeah. I mean, one answer is that complexity theory, you can actually prove some things. And it gets messier, and, and, the, and the theory is much nicer. The other reason is that, in practice, any, t any computational problems you encounter in the real world, typically there's, there's, there's invariably some, ni some natural way of turning those into a qu an equivalent decision problem. You can prove that you can't always do that, but in practice, you can. There was one here. Yeah. So here, do you allow for things like man, 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 or I don't care. Okay, so um, these are included, right? uh, yeah, if you want, or if you prefer to exclude them, that's fine. It doesn't change anything. Thanks to results from the 1970s by people, including, for example, Charlie Bennett, who showed that reverse class reversible classical computation is re is universal, and Friedkin and Toffoli. Sure. The complexity class. Yeah, that's what I'm about to do. No, but I'm not going to um, talk about space complexity classes. 
uh, not that I'm aware of. You, space complexity is one of those things where it's the Turing machine model is just a much more natural way of defining things, and much easier. And we'll see even that for the circuit model, well, let's, um, let's talk about what the, what's the issue here. Why have I got a different complexity class, even though I've kind of done the natural thing with my model? Um, circuit model is certainly equivalent to the Turing machine model, but what, what's the issue here? And it's a subtlety in that you can forget about once you've heard it once. Okay. Um, the problem is that for the, in the circuit model, I have to design a circuit for a certain number of input bits. Right? I feed a certain number of things, lines coming in of bits or qubits, but to my classical bits come into the circuit, and then I define a bunch of gates that act on these. And the problem is for a different num input size, I have to have a different circuit, because circuits apply to, uh, only act on a specific number of bits. So I haven't put any restrictions on how these circuits relate to each other. Right? The circuit for 10 bits inputs could be totally different than the circuit for 11 bit inputs. I haven't said anything about how I construct the circuits. I and I, so I could construct a completely different circuit. And I can smuggle too much computation into the construction of the circuit and allow me to do things like solve the halting problem by this. So we need, to, we need to prevent ourselves cheating by putting essentially a huge amount of the computation into the, into the design of the circuit. And that's how, you, that's how you pin these things down in the circuit model precisely. And you have to put what's known as some uniformity condition on the circuit. So you have to define uniform circuit families. So we have a sequence of circuits Cn, Cn on input size <coughs> n. Right, so for n bits, we have a circuit Cn. It's un this circuit family is uniform. If now we have to say, OK, well, how are we allowed to construct these circuits? And here, it really is Turing machines all the way down. Because the only way I know of to define this is to say there exists a Turing machine which, on input n, constructs, outputs a description of the, of the circuit CN. in poly time. And now we can define P. It's the same thing, solvable, class of decision problem solvable on a poly time, in other words, poly number of gates, uniform circuit. All we need to do is add uniform, the word uniform into our um, definition, and it all works. And indeed, under this condition, we get exactly the same definition of P as we have over there. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, in the problem is not with the complexity classes, and it's with the circuit model of computation. So it's a non-uniform model of computation. It's very nice to work with. It's very nice to design quantum circuits. But it has this annoying subtlety that uh, this is. The problem is the issue is with the circuit model rather than with query versus non-gate complexity. Um, so it doesn't depend on no. the gates? I mean, in query complexity, you're not measuring the number of gates anyway. So, um, but. Then we're talking about query classes, and uh, Scott did that last week. I'm not going to talk about query complexity right. classes. <coughs> query complexity is a different complexity class. Asking, I mean, it's a very different thing. You're not counting the amount of time you, it takes to compute something. You could do an, uh, you know, a triply exponential amount of computation after each query, but you don't count it. You just count calls to this black box, magic black box in query complexity. So it's measuring something completely different. It's measuring a different computation resource, queries to the Oracle, right? But that's another, you can ask about complexity theoretic questions about that. It's a different resource, um, but it's not time complexity. Okay, so once now you know this, you can now forget about it, and everyone does forget about it. Almost any time you construct a circuit, it's very hard to, you know, to add, if you have some circuit algorithm implemented, some algorithm, sorry, expressed as a circuit, like Shaw's algorithm, you don't, t you don't, people don't even bother to go and prove that it's a uniform circuit family. It's kind of obvious. Because by writing down what the circuit looks like on different numbers of input sizes, you've pretty much, that's the algorithm for constructing it. And it's pretty obvious that you could implement that if you wanted to on a Turing machine. And no one bothers to go and do that. Good. OK, at this point, we are now finally in a position to actually define our quantum complexity classes.
um, properly. And it's now, but now we've done all of this work, uh, it's now easy to, um, to define the complexity classes that I'm sure you already know of, and I'm really not going to say we've done all the hard work for constructing these. So the quantum analogues of P and MP are BQP, So what does BQP stand for? Bounded Error Quantum Poly Time. BQP Decision Problems, for which there's a, there exists a poly-sized or poly-time quantum circuit. U, right? U is a product of a whole bunch of gates, right? I'm just going to write that whole circuit as some big unit tree that's made up that can be decomposed into a poly number of gates. Such the probability of U outputs one is bigger than two thirds if the answer is yes, and less than one third if the answer is no. So the only difference, the only the subtlety or the only different new ingredient here is the fact that this. This is a complexity class where this is not a deterministic complexity class, so now the output can be, is probabilistic. I could have gone, I could have defined classical probabilistic computation first, and then uh, and then take, took the step to here. So you can define classical probabilistic complexity classes in the analogous way, but I got to jump straight to quantum because you already know all of this, I suspect. Okay, so quantum mechanics typically measurements are typically not deterministic. The outcomes are probabilistic. What we require is that our uh, if, we're gonna, if we solve the problem, we have a quantum circuit to solve the problem, well, we just need the answer to be right with probability at least two-thirds right, for decision problems. Yeah. Good. No, thanks for asking that. That was what I was going to say next. So the one-third and two-thirds are, arbit are somewhat arbitrary. They're just conventional. And why? Because... I could choose instead, and I would get exactly the same complexity class. In other words, I would get exactly the same family set of problems. I could choose 1 minus epsilon and epsilon instead for any epsilon, for any constant epsilon, or in fact, for any epsilon that's um, 1 over a poly in my problem size. Would even give me. I still wouldn't change the complexity class, or I could also choose um, anything plus or minus epsilon for any constant epsilon, and any epsilon in those range would give me exactly the same uh, complexity classes. Sorry, that's exactly the same complexity class BQP. Okay. Why? What's the argument for that? I'm not going to. I'm going to leave you to prove it as an exercise, but the idea is that I can just run this circuit multiple times and take majority vote. And then by a uh, Chernoff bound, you can prove that that converges exponentially fast to 1 or 0. OK. Yeah? I'm only going to talk about the quantum circuit model of computation. Right? But to actually rigorously define these complexity classes, I still need, this has to be a, oh, I've gone and missed it off. Uh, all I needed to do to make this correct was to put uniform here, and I forgot. There you go. Now I fixed it. Okay. And what is uniform quantum circuit family? I put in the num size n, and my classical Turing machine in poly time outputs a description of the quantum circuit. The classical circuit model and the classical Turing machine model are different computational models that are equivalent under the Church-Turing thesis, and you can prove that. Uniform circuit families. OK, so finally, the other complexity class, the only other quantum complexity class I want to define is the quantum analog of NP. And 
this is the complexity class known as QMA. And QMA really does stand for Quantum Merlin Arthur. I wasn't making up those names. There's a classical complexity class Merlin Arthur. It's the probabilistic version of NP. And Quantum Merlin Arthur is the quantum generalization of that, strictly speaking. So Quantum Merlin Arthur. And this, if you've wrapped your head around the definition of NP, which is right above, then you understand the definition of QMA. So again, decision problems. Exists a uh, poly time quantum verifier or uniform family, uniform quantum verifier circuit. U such that answer on input. Note that the input to the problem is classical, right? The way I define quantum computational problems, they're about the inputs are always natural numbers or binary strings. Right? So the input to a computational problem is always classical, even for quantum complexity classes. For yes instance, if it's a yes, the answer is yes, then there should be a poly-sized quantum witness. Look, I get to write a ket for the first time in this lecture. Uh, such that the probability that you, we act, we feed x and w into the <coughs> circuit and the probability that then we measure the output qubit at the end and it outputs 1 should be bigger than or equal to 2 thirds. And for no instances, then there should not exist any witness that tricks Arthur into thinking the answer is yes when it's really no. Again, the choice of two-thirds and one-third is arbitrary. Go away and prove that it's arbitrary in the same way here. I could have picked one minus epsilon or e and epsilon instead for any epsilon that's, uh, I mean, e yeah, certainly for any constant epsilon, even for an epsilon that's, that's um, getting smaller with n. And I could have picked any, or I could have picked any, uh, any values that are bounded away from a half by a constant. It wouldn't change the class of problems that this is contained here. Yeah, I have. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah? Yes, but I don't want to do it, and neither do you. <laughs> the paper to read is Bernstein Vazirani. I think it's 95. Um, they do it fully, properly. It's subtle and very tedious and very important. OK, I guess I, I want to define a couple more. Uh, well, so I just have time, I think, in the last section of this lecture to define, to introduce one more notion. And then next lecture, we're actually going to use all of this machinery, or at least some of this machinery, um, or the next two lectures. Um, so what time is over here? In the last five, five minutes, I want to introduce the notion of reduction. And then we'll finish for today. So reduction is what lets us actually do, com I mean, a lot of complexity theory we, we, uh, is, is, is about proving reductions. And what is reduction? It lets us compare the difficulty of different computational problems. Right? At the moment, we've got these classes. We can ask if something, we can try and find, figure out if a problem is in one class or in a different class. But we have no notion of whether one problem is more difficult than another. Um, and reduction is the notion that makes that, allows us to give, actually compare the difficulty of quantum problems rather than just classify the difficulty. So what I'm going to define is poly, usually called poly time reduction. More precisely, some, if I'm going to be more pedantic, I should call it poly time many one reduction. 
and sometimes this is, for, that's a mouthful, this is sometimes in the literature called Karp reduction. Okay, I'm going to call it polytime reduction. We say that a computational problem A reduces to B if there's some map from problems A to problems B in class B so that an instance of the problem maps to a, so some map that maps instances of A to instances of B such that such that the answers map up B has answer yes if and only if A has answer yes and the if and only if means that the no answers have to match up and the map A to B is poly time computable I can't really say this is in P because P is for decision problems. This is a computing a function. But polytype computable, we do know what it means. It means the number of steps the Turing machine takes is polynomial in the size of the instance of the input. Okay, and we write, uh, well, you'll s I think I won't in this lecture course, but you sometimes will see this, often see that written as A is less than or equal to B. Why A less than or equal to B? Because if A reduces to B, this means that if we can solve B, we can solve A. So somehow A, B is, A is certainly no more difficult than B. Right. Why? Well, if I want you give me a problem A to solve, I don't know how to solve A, but, maybe I, but imagine I know how to solve B. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to efficiently compute a, uh, an instance B that has the same answer as A, and then I'll, solve, and then I'll use my box that solves B. So if I can reduce A to B, this means that uh, solving B is, is, is as good as solving A. So A is, somehow, in a rigorous sense, easier than A. And then if we have a reduction, if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to A, then we can say that, the, we can say that A is equal to B, in the sense that these, are computationally, <coughs> these problems are computationally equivalent. less than or equal to B and B and A greater than or equal to B. If we have reductions in both directions, then A is equal to B. In other words, A and B are computationally equivalent. Solving either one is as good as solving the other. Good. Okay, this now lets me define two more complexity classes, or actually four more complexity classes. Um, but really only one that you have to understand and then the rest kind of a rather similar. The complexity class NP hard is the class of all, so A is NP, sorry, B is NP hard. B is in the class NP hard if for all A, for all NP problems, there's a A is less than or equal to B. In other words, there's a reduction from any MP problem to B to the problem B. And then the other class that you may have probably heard of, MP complete. Uh, problems that are A, they have to be MP hard and in MP. So problems that are both MP hard and in MP are called MP complete. And we can define QMA hard analogous and QMA complete analogously. surprising fact that there are any NP hard problems, right? There exist problems that every other problem in NP, even ones that no one's written down before, 
and no one's even thought to write down yet, are, can be turned into that problem. So an example is SAT, the problem that I defined had up over here uh, a while back. So SAT is uh, an MP hard problem. It's in fact MP complete. Every other problem in MP you can prove can be turned into an instance of SAT. That was the original first result in complexity theory, in classical complexity. That's called the Cook-Levin theorem. What we're going to do next lecture is prove a quantum version of the Cook-Levin theorem. OK, so finally, I want to end the lecture by drawing a picture that I think Scott had up. Um, I'm sure Scott had more interesting pictures than this up during his lecture. I haven't watched all of the videos. But I'm going to draw the one he started with. Um, and that is the, I've defined all of these complexity classes. So what, we essentially know how, have no idea about how all of the classes that I've defined relate to each other. Right? Every single relation between these, most of them, some of them are either we know by de because just by definition of the problems how they relate, or it's a big open problem and you would get very famous by solving it. So this is, let me just give you a little, a tiny little peep into the complexity zoo. So relationship between all of these classes, P, NP, BQP, QMA. Most of the relationships is a, or the full relationship between these definitely is an open problem. Okay. Let me go through a few of them. So P, can, is P and BQP, okay, this is an easy one uh, because this is just classical computation. This we do know. It's classical is a special case of quantum. And similarly, we know that MP is contained in QMA. This is just by definite, well, by the fact that classical computation is a special case of quantum computation. That's not trivial but was known before quantum computation was invented. It, relies, it requires the fact that reversible classical computation is just as powerful as normal classical computation. But that was known since the 70s. P versus MP? Well, this has a million dollar prize attached to it. So that's kind of important. Um, much more interesting is P equal to BQP or probably more precisely BPP, the probabilistic version of P, but okay, let's write P. This is, what is this question? This is the complexity theoretic, precise complexity theoretic quest version of are quantum computers useful? We're all here today because mm, a lot of people think that the answer is no to this question. But who knows, tomorrow someone could destroy all of our funding and all of our quantum startup companies will crash overnight because someone proves that P is equal to BQP. Unknown. B BQP, what about BQP versus QMA? Well, this is the quantum P versus MP problem. Unfortunately, there's no, it's a much, much more important problem than this one, but there's no million dollars for it. You just get the fame. What about NP versus QMA? So this is open. There's reasons to think that this is unlikely, but this is an open problem as well. And the only things that are not open here are the ones that are true by definition, or that we know by definition. So all of these are big, important problems in quantum complexity theory and classical complexity theory, and I encourage you to go out, think about them, and hopefully solve them, because well, I don't work on complexity theory, but Scott has fa failed to solve these problems so far, so it's time a younger generation came along. The good thing is that I'm lecturing after Scott, so he can't get back at me. <laughs> well, oh no, he can. He has a blog. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Scott won't have time to watch the videos for this, but Graham will, of course, email him to tell him he should. Good. I'm looking forward to a blog post taking the... Make out of me on blogs, uh, Scott's blog. Okay, so let me let me just give you the general belief. So we don't. There's there's not just it's not just belief because of you know what we sort of see in practice. There's also some good comple theoretical complexity theory e theory e evidence for this, which I can't. I don't have time to tell you about, but um, is very interesting. But the general belief is um, BQP sits here, so. 
it contains it contains p by definition. We don't believe it contains all of NP. Um, QMA by def is of course all all the way around this. So an example of a problem that's in here would be factoring, and you saw that last week. Shaw's algorithm. We don't know that factoring is in P. It might be also open, but the pro if it's, it probably doesn't seem to be in P as far as we know so far. But it is in BQP. But okay. So then, what about the other two complexity classes or four complexity classes I defined? So QMA complete. That's uh, sorry. That's um, that's the class MP hard. So there are problems that are not in NP that everything in NP can be turned into, but there are also some problems like SAT that are in NP and can still and are still MP hard. This intersection here, this is the M, this is MP hard. And finally, QMA hard. Okay, you have to think a bit, but because it's a hardness class, QMA hard sits inside here and doesn't include SAT. Uh, now I'm running out of space. Uh, there, I can put SAT there. And then this class here is, this is QMA hard. Oh, and I've gone and, I've gone and intersected QMA hard with MP. That's probably not the case. So there we go. Okay, that's the general belief. Okay, but as far as we know, it could be that this diagram looks, this picture looks a bit different. And this, I think, Scott didn't draw. But it could be that the diagram looks like this. That's it. P, NP, CQP, QMA are all equal. It's possible. We don't know. It's open that everything is open. And so yeah, I encourage you to go away and think about this. And next time, we'll use some of this stuff to say some things about Sure. I mean, there's an entire complexity theory zoo of which we're looking at them just the smallest part of. So one complexity class we have sort of defined, actually, that's outside of all of this is halting, or, or the class of computable problems. Right? That's outside all of complexity theory. If you like, you can view that as the, the biggest complexity class, if you like. Um, but then, the, yeah, there's an, there's an infinitely infinite families of complexity classes between P and computable. They're not. OK, that's a very good point. This ordering on, complex, on problems that I've defined here, um, up here, this is a partial order. On here. So what is QMA hard in MP-hard? Because if a problem is QMA hard, then it's definitely MP-hard, because MP is a special case of QMA. But the converse is not true. If something's MP-hard, like SAT, we don't think SAT is QMA hard. So that's why the inclusion is that way around. It's because it's a hardness class. The, ordering go the order goes in the other direction by the fact that classical is a special case of quantum. If you, that's not clear, you go away and, and think a bit. Um, it's just, you just have to wrap your head around it. And I, it's a bit confusing the first time you see it, but I have no better way of explaining it than it's just by the fact that classical is a special case of quantum. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, amplified the completeness gap in the QMA case? Yes. Sorry? Since you're only working, since Merlin only gives you one proof, you can't just run the algorithm. That's a very good question. It turns out you can amplify just like you can for, M, uh, for BQP. It's not completely trivial for the reason you just said. Um, but it turns out you can do it. And it's not too difficult to prove. And I leave that as an exercise. So, so just to, sorry, just to finish. I mean, the idea is the same. You run the verifier multiple times. But the, and that will be fine, except that Merlin can now cheat in a new way. He can, because now you need multiple copies of the witness. That's fine. That's just a bigger witness. But the problem is that <coughs> this, the correct, the run, if you're running the algorithm, it relies on the fact that these witnesses are all separate. In other words, they're product, a product witness. But nothing makes Merlin do that. He could be nasty and give you a big entangled state that he claims is this copies of the witness. Turns out you can prove by a convexity argument. It's not that difficult, but you can prove by a, but you have to prove it. That doesn't actually give Merlin any advantage. The best thing he could do was, was to give you product witnesses. Um, but you have to prove that, and it's, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is, um, this is the general belief. Because if, you had, if this intersected P, that would imply P equals MP. And the general belief is probably that it's not. They're not equal. Uh, why? Think about it. So we'd have a problem in P, which you could turn all other MP problems into. That would mean you could solve all other problems in MP and P. Because we'd first thing we do, we'd do a polytime computation to turn it into this problem that you was in P, and then we'd solve the problem in P. So that would, so that's why these aren't exact. That's the general belief. I guess it's fed. I mean, I'm dead, there's, there's plenty of computer scientists that would give me lots of reasons, or complexity theorists that would say P is clearly not equal to MP, P is clearly equal to MP. But okay, this is not the general consensus. But I think I mean it's fair that the general kind of consensus amongst most 51% of computer scientists believe this picture. <laughs> Sure. Um, usually, yes. Uh, that's normally how you prove something as MP, but not always. You can have existence proofs of things PMP. Dan Gottesman. I mean, there are plenty of results like this, but one I rather I one I know of like, is very nice. Is Dan Gottesman has a problem about Hamiltonians, where the um, the problem. You can prove it's in P. Sorry, uh, you can prove it's in P, but constructing the algorithm is undecidable. You just have to check if something is bigger or smaller than some number. But your problem is you don't know what to figure out what the number you have to compare to is undecidable. But it's some fixed number, so you get that can crop up. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, everything in complexity theory is up to yes. Okay, fine. But that proof that it's in P is of the flavor that you don't actually have an algorithm, you just have an existence. Proof. Is this general Last. Um, some of the evidence, yes. Um, but there are also other, ev uh, there's, other, there's, other, there's other theoretical evidence. So some of the theoretical evidence I'm referring to, yes, is oracle separations. Other theoretical evidence is not. It's like natural proofs, um, results from the 90s. Um, and there's a bunch of theoretical evidence, but I don't have time, as well as kind of evidence from experience, but I don't have time to talk about any of that. Go, go and read. Scott has a nice article on P versus MP that's from some years ago, but is a very nice kind of overview of that. I, okay. So Graham's telling me now I should stop. If there are any more questions, just come and ask me after.